Welcome to Digital Detectives, reports from the battlefront. We'll discuss computer forensics, electronic discovery, and information security issues and what's really happening in the trenches. Not theory, but practical information that you can use in your law practice, right here on the Legal Talk Network. Welcome to the 121st edition of Digital Detectives. We're glad to have you with us. I'm Sharon Nelson, president of Sensei Enterprises, a digital forensics, cybersecurity, and information technology firm in Fairfax, Virginia. And I'm John Simic, vice president of Sensei Enterprises. Today on Digital Detectives, our topic is ransomware surges, what law firms need to know. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Thanks to our sponsor, PINow.com. If you need a private investigator you can trust, visit PINow.com to learn more. Today, we're lucky to have as our guest, Ted Kobus, a partner and the firm-wide chair of Baker Hostetler's Digital Assets and Data Management Group. He has led the defense of hundreds of regulatory investigations, including those brought by the Attorney General Multistate, Department of Health and Human Services, Office for Civil Rights, Department of Insurance, SEC, and FTC. In the healthcare space, Ted has defended more than 200 OCR investigations and has negotiated more privacy security related resolution agreements than any other lawyer. It's great to have you with us today, Ted. Well, thanks for having me today. It's great to be with you both. Well, Ted, according to your firm's annual report issued in April 2020 by your Digital Assets and Data Management Group, ransomware has surged in both the number of incidents and the amount of the ransom paid, and there is no foreseeable slowdown. What percentage of the 1,000 incidents included in the current report involved ransomware, and has that percentage increased from the 2019 report? So approximately 25% of the incidents we worked on in 2019 involved ransomware. We love to talk about how 2020 is the year that you fill in the blank, but in reality, 2020 really is the year of ransomware, and it's when it really blew up. We're still crunching the numbers, but my guess is approximately 35 to 40% of our matters involve ransomware this year. On top of that, we are likely to work on 1,700 incidents this year, which is a 70% increase over last year. That's a lot of ransomware. Late last year, we joked on our team about ransomware Thursday because a lot of ransomware matters would come in on Thursdays. Now we're seeing one to five new matters every day of the week. That's phenomenal. <laughs> it is It is phenomenal, but it is consistent with we're a much smaller firm, obviously, but uh, we can't believe how it's blown up either. <laughs> well, well, Ted, we, what we've also noticed, though, is that there's a there's been a huge increase in, in the amount of the ransom that the cyber criminals are demanding. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the increases from 2018 to 2019 and, and what you're expecting to see for, for this year? Yeah, the demands are getting out of control. Uh, the overwhelming majority of ransoms are paid in Bitcoin. So all of the statistics that I'm going to provide today uh, in the U.S. dollar equivalent at the, at the time that the, the, the event happened. So as you're likely aware, we see great fluctuations in the, in the Bitcoin exchange rate. And that's sort of why we don't talk in terms of, of Bitcoins and we talk in terms of, of U.S. dollars. So in 2018, the average ransom paid was a little under $30,000. And the highest demand that year was probably around $1 million. I believe in 2018, the largest ransom that we actually paid was approximately $250,000. Now, in 2019, that's when we saw the highest demand skyrocket to $18 million and the highest amount paid to $5.6 million. When we look at the average paid, it probably was around $300,000 that year. 2020 was a game changer. And if you found the, the increases in two, 2019 to be startling, you might want to sit down for the 2020 stat. <laughs> <laughs> and, and keep in mind, the year is not over. We still have another month. <laughs> oh, please, no. <laughs> sit, sit, down, sit, sit down or lay down. <laughs> you may want to lay down. Uh, this year, our highest demand was $68 million. The highest paid was a bit over $15 million. And I don't have the average paid yet for this year, 
but we are paying multi-million dollar ransoms every week. Jeez. Yeah, this really this really has become a scourge. And as as we all well know, ransomware victims are now often hit with two ransoms rather than one. And and while we could both explain it, I'm sure you're going to do it better. So would you explain why that is? Because pe- people still are not aware when we go out and lecture, which is what we do a lot. They don't know about these two ransoms. So so take it from the top. <laughs> yeah, and, and it, it's not the BOGO or the buy one, two, one, <laughs> buy one, get one free. <laughs> <laughs> that we, we so look forward to. It's actually a, a, a single ransom, but it has two components. And, and this really was the game changer. I'd say we, we've talked about so many statistics that, that changed the game, but this really is one of the statistics that, that changed the game. The threat actors figured out rather quickly that many companies can restore from backups. And if you can restore from backups, then you likely do not need to purchase the decryption key to unlock your data. So what we're seeing is more and more groups stealing information and then threatening to post it if you refuse to pay an extortion fee. So that's sort of the two for one component that we're seeing in in ransomware these Mm -hmm. days. Well, I know we have, Sharon, I have some personal experiences with with these things, Ted, but I have to ask this question. (laughs) How how much do you think you you can trust that if you pay the ransom, you're actually going to get a valid decryption key? and whether or not the criminals will in fact destroy and not divulge any confidential data that they may have exfiltrated. I I tell clients there are good criminals and there are bad criminals. And (laughs) the the good criminals are the ones that you can trust more than the bad criminals. Uh, So as for the decryption key, remember, these criminals are in a business and their business is to make money. So if they don't follow through on their promise to provide the decryption key, they will get a bad reputation and it'll hurt their ability to extort money from the next business. <laughs> so, they, only get four, they only get a four-star rating then. <laughs> correct. correct. And that's exactly what we do. We track the default rate so that we're able to tell the client, yeah, you know what, when you're dealing with this, with this criminal, the default rate is low and it's very unlikely that they're not going to follow through and, and provide the, the decryption key. So we really do find that the threat actors want to keep their reputation of keeping their word. The instances, because we have seen some defaults, the majority of those instances where the threat actor defaults is where they screwed up and they accidentally did something they didn't intend to do and they're not able to follow through. And they are extremely apologetic (laughs) when that occurs. Um, It doesn't give the client (laughs) any comfort, but (laughs) it does really show that their intent is to follow through so that they can extort the, the next business who is victim to their crime. When it comes to the the deletion of the information, a similar philosophy applies. They often provide evidence of deletion, and we have not seen subsequent posting of information after payment. In one case, we had a large amount of data that was, was stolen, and it took the threat actor over a week to actually delete the information, and they would send us a status of where the deletion was in in, in progress and how much more they had to go. So we actually saw the process. Now, did they have a second copy of it? I don't know, but they do do take steps to show you and, and try to give you comfort that they are no longer in possession of that information. The one thing that I think we do need to watch, and that is the rate of re extortion. That is where the threat actor comes back after you pay and makes a renewed demand. Now, we didn't see this frequently historically. We've seen it a few times over the past two years, including very recently, but it's still a limited occurrence. And there are a few signs to look out for. Quick drops in the ultimate demand and low amounts demanded compared to what the threat actor may have demanded in other matters. So it's it's good to watch this carefully so that you have an idea of whether or not this may occur. 
I have a bit of a, a follow up there, Ted. You, you were talking about knowing the the criminals and you know who they are and whether they had a record of of paying up. Um, one of the things that struck us very recently when we were working a case is that Homeland Security came out on a Sunday, no less, and they they were talking to us and they were saying that even they can only source about ten percent of the where the attacks are coming from, and and of course these people tend not to tell you who they are. So so is it different for, for you and your experience? I mean, 10% seemed very small to me. Right. So, in, in, and as you know, you know this, the in attribution has always been a challenge in uh, the cyber world. And ransomware is, is not any different. We will know who the a, a attack group is because they uh, use a name associated with the type of malware. So in the ransom note, we usually see the name of the, the threat actor and, and we'll know who it is. But beyond that, we really don't know who they're connected to, where they're out of. Um, sometimes you, you may be able to guess regions of the world based on the language expression used in the negotiations. But other than that, we find it extremely difficult to ever really tie it back to a specific individual group or, or government. Well, let's move on to something that, that we've been really interested in this year, and that is that cyber insurance companies do seem to be more and more of a game changer in that they seem increasingly anxious to pay the ransom. They seem to feel like it will cost them 10 times more if they don't pay the ransom, and they'd rather get the ransom paid and get the data back. Is that also your experience, and why are some of them advocating the payment of the ransom? Just, just for money? Well, my my experience is that most of the leading cyber carriers are not heavily weighing in on whether the ransom should or should not be paid. I think what they are doing is making sure that companies are considering whether or not it may be the less expensive option. A lot of these cyber policies include business interruption insurance and cover, may cover reputational losses. And if it takes longer to restore from backups than to pay the ransom, I think they want you to consider actually paying the ransom to get the decryption key to sort of offset those losses. When it comes to the extortion component, we really see them deferring to companies and, and, and really having a, an understanding of if the data is important from a confidentiality ex standpoint, if it gets exposed, how sensitive that information is, and will paying the threat actor to not post the information, will that actually help mitigate against any damages in a, in a class action lawsuit or potentially help in a situation where you're uh, participating in a, in a regulatory investigation? Thank you. That's that's very useful as a perspective. I, I I do think the involvement of cyber insurance has has at least increased in, in how often they they are involved somehow in the decision making process. Yes, agreed. Well, before we move on to our next segment, let's take a quick commercial break. Does your law firm need an investigator for a background check, civil investigation, or other type of investigation? PINow.com is a one-of-a-kind resource for locating investigators anywhere in the U.S. and worldwide. The professionals listed on PI Now understand the legal constraints of an investigation, are up-to-date on the latest technology, and have extensive experience in many types of investigation, including workers' compensation and surveillance. Find a pre-screened private investigator today. Visit www.pinow.com. Welcome back to Digital Detectives on the Legal Talk Network. Today, our topic is ransomware surges, what law firms need to know. Our guest is Ted Kobus, a partner and firm-wide chair of Baker Hostler's Digital Assets and Data Management Group. Well, Ted, recently the, the Office of Foreign Asset Control issued an advisory regarding ransom payments and the risk of sanctions violations associated with such payments. But while the, the U.S. government doesn't recommend paying a ransom, and we've heard that multiple times from the FBI as an example, there is no general ban on that. So can you tell us a little bit about the, the advisory and, and what it means for a, a business, for an entity that's been struck by ransomware? 
Right. So that's that is probably the number one question. Am I allowed to pay the ransom? Is it illegal to do that? And there have been a lot of questions swirling around the appropriateness of paying ransom. And I think the recent OFAC advisory reiterated a lot of what we already knew. One, we, we know the U.S. government disfavors paying ransom as a public policy position. But the reality is the U.S. government also knows that sometimes you have no other option. We've also known that the FBI struggles in these investigations because there is not enough reporting when these incidents occur. The OFAC advisory makes it clear that the U.S. government wants to see more outreach by companies to the FBI when they are hit by ransomware. So we regularly reach out to the FBI and, and I actually find it very surprising that there are still lawyers out there frightening their clients and encouraging them not to reach out. The advisory is going to change that, in my opinion. And I, I think the advisory makes it clear that you need to conduct the appropriate due diligence during the sanctions compliance check to confirm there is no no nexus to a sanctioned individual, entity, or government. I think people have been doing that all along, but it, they just really reiterated the fact that this is a critical component of the process. And, and I think importantly, and finally, OFAC has not invited companies to ask for permission to make a payment in every matter. It is only in those very, very, very limited situations where there is a known nexus with a sanctioned individual entity or government that an application for a license would be appropriate. However, OFAC has made it clear that there will be a presumption of denial on any application simply from a, a public policy standpoint. I know that this has been around this policy for a while, but people didn't know about it. I mean, that's that's just a fact. And and so for some reason, recently when they issued this, it, it got all around and all of these folks from smaller law firms started calling us and saying, well, how much you know is the penalty? And of course, you, you tell them 20 million and they faint, uh, at least up to 20 million. Of course, you also tell them that there are, there are ameliorating factors, you know, if they had no reason to know that they were dealing with sanctioned groups, et cetera. But it, it is very difficult to comply with the advisory if you can't know who you're dealing with, right? Right. Many people get nervous about the fact that we cannot attach a, a malware, a ransomware variant with a specific threat actor, government, entity, individual. And that has always been a challenge in, in the cyber world. That is not what the advisory tells us to do. The advisory requires you to, or reiterates the importance of going through your due diligence and, and compliance sanctions check to make sure that there is no known nexus to a, a sanctioned individual, group, or government. And that's really what you're required to do. So it's, it's important that when you go through this process, you're working with experienced incident response partners, including your lawyers, forensics companies, and payment facilitators. And all of those partners should be involved in regular threat information sharing with the FBI. Through that type of collaboration and partnership, companies are able to get comfort that the payment is not prohibited by law. And that's, that's the best answer I've ever heard to the question. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry. Ted's going to send you a bill. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, Ted, Ted we, know, we know you have a bulleted list of, of important points that the advisory does not address. Can you talk to us a little bit about those? Yeah. So even though there is a belief that the advisory was prompted by speculative and rumored connection of a new ransomware variant to a sanctioned organization, the advisory did not list any new ransomware variants. I think that was intentional. Just recently, a new ransomware variant was added. And again, it was not the variant involved in the speculative discussions. The advisory also did not expand the connection to known and sanctioned groups to other variants of ransomware. And OFAC had an opportunity to do that. And then finally, the advisory certainly did not include an invitation to ask OFAC for approval every time you're going to make a payment. In fact, I think that's exactly what they told us not to do. 
Well, it, it's interesting that what people ask us all the time is, you know, what's the real skinny? What do you recommend that companies do and not do if they're hit by ransomware? And I think you'd probably be a very good person to answer precisely that question. Well, I certainly have an opinion, that's for sure. <laughs> I would just say, don't panic and don't start reading blogs on what you can or can't do. Work with experienced vendors. Work with vendors who have dealt with your malware variant. Your counsel should be aware of which FBI field office has been assigned to investigate your malware variant. And you should work with your counsel at, at some point to report the incident to FBI. Determine the timeline for restoring from backups compared to paying for the key and engage with the threat actor to determine what they have and what they may admit they may want. But don't start that until you get the right vendors on board. Get your executives on board with the notion that payment may be required ultimately. And even if you don't end up paying, you will likely have to engage in communications with the threat actor. And then when and if you do make a payment, make sure you have the assurances from your vendors that payment is appropriate. So as, as a follow-up question, what we're often asked is you're assuming, and you said this, that you're going to talk at some point to a data breach lawyer. Uh, you're going to talk to digital forensics. You're going to talk to the FBI. They want us very specifically to say, who do you call first, second, and third? <laughs> well, I'm a lawyer, so I would say you call lawyer first. <laughs> I guess I could have predicted that one. <laughs> <laughs> that was a giveaway. Uh, I, I do think, well, if you have cyber insurance, you should be calling your broker or your cyber carrier immediately. I think then engaging counsel and forensics is your next step. And, and once you have them engaged, you can conduct a privileged investigation and you can determine the strategy that's best suited for that specific threat actor. Okay, how about digital forensics and the FBI? Who, who do you bring in first? I definitely bring in digital forensics first. I make sure that I have answers to uh, several questions before I go to the FBI. Going to the FBI, even though we go to the FBI on a regular basis and we do find them helpful in many situations, I like to be prepared with more facts and more information before making an outreach. I also like to keep control of our investigation and make sure that we're coordinated with the client, coordinated with forensics before making that outreach to the FBI. Well, well Ted, you already alluded to this about how 2020 has been one heck of a year. <laughs> how about the, the working from home and, and the impact on, on the ransomware problem? So it, we've seen, a, well, when we take a look at, at 2020, what we have seen is we're on email a lot more than we ever were. And because of that, we've seen increased phishing attacks, which is the way a lot of these ransomware attacks start. Also, what we saw is that once we started going back to work and the lockdowns were lifted, we started discovering a lot of incidents that may have been unnoticed because we weren't in the office and connected to the network. So I'm not sure that the, the increase in ransomware can be attributed to COVID. In fact, in the beginning of COVID, we actually had some threat actors saying, oh, we're not going to attack hospitals because they're, they're being taxed by um, the, the pandemic and that's not the right thing to do. That was short-lived and they started going back out to hospitals again. <laughs> but I do think that there was a period of time where we really weren't seeing what was going on in our network. And then once we started going back to work, we, we were able to uncover a lot of that. It's a, that's interesting you say that because the, then I guess that that was a bogus alert that the government gave about uh, warning health care. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, look, I, I'm not going to tempt fate. And I will tell you that we were prepared that weekend and we'll still be prepared if that ever comes. And I think that what the FBI did in sharing that was very good for businesses and, and, and the public. Um, because if something did happen that weekend and information wasn't shared, there would have been a lot of angry people. And you mm -hmm. saw healthcare organizations working together over those days to figure out how to 
quickly shut down an attack, engaging in threat information sharing, probably beyond what they normally do. And, and I thought that was, it was extremely helpful. Well, we certainly want to thank you, Ted, for being with us today as our guest. That has been just uh, fascinating stuff. I know a lot of the listeners, this is brand new to many of them, or at least much of it is. Uh, and, and on my own behalf, I want to thank you for answering the who you're going to call uh, question. <laughs> and and I, I want to thank you for the upcoming PowerPoint slide, which says, one, uh, cyber insurance carrier, two, uh, cyber uh, data breach lawyer, three, digital forensics, and four, the FBI. So thank you for creating that slide for me. Um, and it really has been a fun and, and very informative podcast. And, and we're very happy that you could be with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's, it has been a lot of fun. I appreciate the time. Well, that does it for this edition of Digital Detectives. And remember, you can subscribe to all the editions of this podcast at LegalTalkNetwork.com or an Apple Podcasts. And if you enjoyed our podcast, please rate us on Apple Podcasts. You can find out more about Sensei's digital forensics, technology, and cybersecurity services at senseient.com. We'll see you next time on Digital Detectives. Thanks for listening to Digital Detectives on the Legal Talk Network. Check out some of our other podcasts on LegalTalkNetwork.com and in iTunes.